good uh, good morning good afternoon good evening um good night um to all of those who are attending this this webinar a very warm welcome to you um i uh, am the co-author of uh, european sanctions com, which is a blog that I do with Maya Lester, who's one of the panelists uh, today. And we came up with the idea of having this webinar a few days ago, given what was happening in the world in relation to Russia and Ukraine. When we came up with the idea, we thought we might get an attendance of around about 100 people. We've now had over 1,600 res registrations for this webinar, which goes to show the level of interest, the level of concern, and uh, the desire that people have to get some sort of guidance about how to navigate what may well be very choppy waters in the weeks, months, and possibly years ahead. So to help with that navigation, I've got a, a wonderful panel of speakers, and we're going to be discussing a number of subjects around uh, the sanctions that may be coming in relation to Russia in, in respect of its activities in Ukraine. So, we expect that this is going to take about an, an hour. We're going to try to have some room left for questions at the end. If we don't get to all of your questions, which is likely, I think, given the number of attendees, please um, bear with us. And what we will try to do is get to your questions and respond to them uh, in the days after this particular webinar, which is being uh, recorded. Um, so without wasting any more time, let me just briefly introduce the speakers. First of all, um, we have Adam Smith, who's a partner at Gibson, Dun & Crutcher. He was for five years, a senior advisor to the director of OFAC, and he was the director of multilateral affairs, the National Security Council. What is particularly pertinent about Adam's experience for today's purposes is that in 2014, he played a key role in developing US sanctions in response to the annexation of Crimea, which involved him spending a considerable amount of time in Brussels and in London, coordinating the US and international response. We also have Chloe Sina, who was a legal advisor to the UK Foreign Office. As with Adam in 2014, Chloe was also heavily involved in the response of the UK government to the annexation of Crimea and the sanctions that flowed from that in an EU context, obviously pre-Brexit. Chloe is now, importantly, the head of the Global Sanctions Advisory at Deutsche Bank. And last but certainly not least is my co-author of the sanctions blog, Maya Lester. Maya Lester is a QC at Brickcourt Chambers in London. And she is uh, very well versed at advising in relation to international sanctions and appearing before the Luxembourg courts arguing sanctions cases. So uh, I'm going to start with Adam and I'm going to ask Adam briefly for the audience. Many of you will be very well versed in sanctions, some of you less well versed. So Adam, perhaps for those less well versed, if you could briefly just map out for us, what is the current landscape in relation to sanctions on Russia imposed by the United States. Absolutely, Michael, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is obviously a very timely subject. Um, the Russian sanctions have quickly become amongst the mo most robust and really most complex sanctions programs that the US has. If you look at sort of just the raw numbers, there are about 650 entities and individuals in Russia that are currently sanctioned by the United States government. However, if you dig a bit deeper, you recognize that only some of them are formally blacklisted, put on the SDN list, whereas about half of them are on the non-SDN list. And that sort of says a lot about the current status of sanctions. What I mean by that is that there are four different sorts of sanctions in Russia. This again speaks to the complexity we're talking about. On the one side, you have traditional old fashioned SDN sanctions. And so there are individuals, some oligarchs, some financial institutions, some organizations and some uh, companies that are formally blacklisted in Russia, um, 300, 400 or so. You also then have with respect to Crimea, old fashioned jurisdiction based sanctions. So Crimea, much like Cuba, much like DPRK, Syria, et cetera, in the US context and Iran is off limits from the perspective of investment and engagement. 
So those are sort of the old fashioned sort of sanctions. You then have two sort of newfangled, not so new anymore since they were been around since 2014 or thereabouts. So on the one side, you have sectoral sanctions. So the principal sanctions on the major banks, the major energy companies, and the major defense sector companies in Russia are not blacklist sanctions, but rather more limited gray list sanctions that sort of limit the ability for those sorts of companies to have access to things in the West, but not all transactions at all. And by things, I principally mean investment, debt, and credit um, that they might get in the West. So that's the principal sanctions in place against the big banks, energy companies, et cetera. And finally, you have secondary sanctions, which those in the audience may, rec may recognize from the Iran context and very much borrows from the Iran context. Under a law called CATSA, um, what that law allows is secondary sanctions. So sanctions that can be imposed on parties that have engaged in transactions with Russia that the US really doesn't like, even if those transactions have no US touch point at all. Principally, those sanctions most famously have been imposed against uh, elements in Turkey for buying the S-400 missiles from the Russian defense sector. But generally speaking, those sanctions have not really been imposed, at least not to the robust level that many could, many think that they could and, and should be imposed. So that's the, the, that's the, uh, the status as they currently stand. Very complex, uh, very, very fluid, and sort of hard to navigate around as it currently stands, let alone if there are significant changes going forward. Okay, Adam, thanks very much for that. Can I just ask you, in relation to timing, we'll come on to what you predict may be the, the, the formulation of sanctions in a moment. In relation to timing, a few days ago, Ukraine's foreign minister came out and was trying to encourage Western powers to impose sanctions now before any steps are taken by the Russian government as a way of demonstrating you know, strength, what, what, you know, what may be coming um, even more forcefully. Do, do you think that's realistic from a US perspective? I don't think that's realistic. I don't think that's realistic for two reasons. One, that's not what the US has said they're going to do. And I think that this is not a situation in which there's gonna be much, much bluffing, at least not publicly. Secondly, and perhaps most critically for this administration, it seems highly unlikely that the Europeans and the broader Western powers would go along with such a preemptive strike. And this administration has made it very clear that sanctions and perhaps the broader response is going to be on a multilateral basis. So I think that's highly unlikely and certainly wouldn't be something that's ever been done before, right? So this would be a, a unprecedented act to preemptively go after them on a sanctions basis. That doesn't mean they couldn't. They certainly could as a legal matter, but I find it highly unlikely for those two reasons. Okay, okay. So then turning to the, you know, the meat and potatoes of this, what, what in your view is likely to happen in terms of US enforcement and sanctions policy if Russia was to take steps, which people are describing as, a, as an invasion. And I understand that there are many different ways of considering what that might consist of. But yeah. if Russia does take steps, which would trigger sanctions enforcement. So I think that the, the menu, right, the ladder of escalation is actually the same today as it was back in 2014 when Chloe and I were in, were in our respective governments. Uh, and so, Really, and, and, and what makes this a little more complicated from the US perspective is you actually have two other, one other player in sort of the sanctions space, and that is Congress. Congress has become very clear as what they would like to do. And there are current bills, one in particular, that sets out the menu fairly clearly uh, in line with, I think, what they're trying to do. And Congress has actually pressured the administration to sort of follow along that path. But the menu is pretty clear. So as I mentioned, there are a whole host of entities uh, in Russia, the big banks, energy companies in particular, they're not formally blacklisted. So I think one of the options is to move some number of those entities that are currently sectorally sanctioned, limited restrictions in some ways, onto the formal blacklist, right? I think that's sort of one of the ideas, so the big banks, the big energy companies, et cetera. I think another idea to go along that sort of path of escalation is to go after Russian sovereign debt. Right, I think that is definitely on the table. Um, what that would mean with respect to existing debt, in other words, secondary market sales of debt versus not, I don't know, right? And that's one of the big questions about the actual implementation is if you go after entities like the banks, the energy companies, et cetera, or the sovereign debt, do you allow wind down proceedings? Do you allow uh, exceptions for licensing and other purposes? So actually the intricacies of how it's implemented is gonna be as important exactly as what is done. Further on the, uh, down the road, I do think there are um, a, a, a newfangled idea to sort of potentially impose export controls of various sorts that people are talking a lot about this, something called the foreign direct product rule, which broadly speaking is like secondary sanctions in the export control space. So this would basically mean that the US will not send things like chips and other high, high technology goods into Russia. They also will not allow companies outside of the United States 
that rely upon US technology to produce things like chips and other technology to be sold uh, into Russia without a license. Um, and so and that license, of course, would be presumptively banned. And then finally, um, presumptively denied rather. Finally, there is the question about SWIFT, um, which I of course wrote an article about uh, in Foreign Affairs at the beginning of the year um, that I think is definitely on the table, uh, is viewed in some respects as a third rail by those principally in Europe and even some in the United States. And that of course would, would restrict the ability for Russia to sort of engage in the normal form of, of financial communication that banks engage in around the world. Uh, question of what the impact of that would be, and we can talk more about that. But that's that's the escalation strategy. And there are a couple of couple of other bits of noise we can talk about, sanctioning President Putin himself, et cetera. But th I think that's more noise than, than actual um, information. Uh, I think at the end of the day, that's the that's the escalation strategy that, that the US is, is trying try to work through with its client, with, with, its, with its colleagues uh, across the Atlantic. So can we, we'll come back in a moment to the degree to which there's gonna be coordination between the United States uh, the European Union, the United Kingdom, et cetera, in a, in a moment. But you mentioned SWIFT. If I could just turn briefly to, 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 to Chloe. Um, in respect of the banking sector, Chloe, if the SWIFT system is disconnected for Russian banks, what do you think that is the, the consequences of that's going to be for the EU, UK banking sector? Um, well, I had the benefit of reading Adam's article um, which I think you should share with anybody that's on this webinar. It was very informative. I think the important matter here is we've seen SWIFT used as a foreign policy weapon before in the context of Iran. So in the banking sector, we've got some knowledge of what it would look like, how this could work. So if the US was to cut SWIFT communications for all Russian banks in the same way as it did in the Iran context, practically all activity involving global banks would be made impossible because no longer could establish international norms be used. It's worth bearing in mind that if the restrictions are introduced impacting SWIFT, it's um, likely to be that most, if not all of the major re Russian state-owned banks will already have been um, uh, the blacklisted, as Adam explained. And so their assets would have been frozen by the US, I think, as a precursor to cutting them out of SWIFT. And so in any event, it would be impossible for US persons to engage in any activity with those banks. I think for a bank um, that isn't a US bank, operationally, it would still have a huge impact, um, far more so than the um, Iran context, because when Iran was shut out of the system, it was a much smaller economy. And, and so it's um, going to be quite far reaching. And I think it would dramatically impact the wind down activity because there wouldn't be the ability to be able to exchange messages with counterparties because this couldn't be carried out on SWIFT. And so I think a lot depends on whether or not SWIFT is used to shut out some of the smaller banks or the major banks like Spurbank. If we're looking at the latter, it could effectively shut Russia out of the international financial system as banks also seek to de-risk. Um, <clears throat> just while we're on that subject, I'm just looking at some of the questions that are coming through. Chloe. And one question whilst we're talking about SWIFT is, is what about the potential impact of Swiss restrictions on to EU subsidiaries of Russian targeted banks? It's a really difficult question, and I think it's one that is uh, legally complex for those that certainly, you know, banks that have um, um, a presence in the rush in, in, in Russia um, will find themselves in a direct conflict of law because there are Russian civil codes, which means that they will have to engage in domestic transactions. And one of the things that we've been looking at is what would that mean for a cross-border transaction where, for example, you've got a loophole um, in a client who can transfer domestically and then require a cross-border transaction in an alternative way. So I think it's going to be a really tricky um, situation for anybody that's got a big Russia presence. Adam, I see you're nodding your head. Yeah, it, indeed. I mean, one of the things, and I think Chloe said it very correctly, that if you de-SWIFT or move SWIFT without blacklisting, um, what you encourage is workarounds, because at the end of the day, Swift is is not magical, right? It, it's a secure email communications platform that's used by global banks. 
It's a critical, important piece of infrastructure. But if you do not blacklist entities, what you encourage is people work to work around it, which is challenging, but possible. If you do blacklist entities, including with respect to foreign subsidiaries, for instance, of Russian banks in the EU, which under EU regulations have been exempt, but under US regulations have not, somewhat challenging, then it actually becomes a bit cleaner about what the de-swifting actually means. And so it, whether or not you, you blacklist and de-swift or de-swift without blacklisting, the impact I think would be rather different depending on what order you approach that um, those sanctions in. Can I just come back to something that you mentioned a moment ago, uh, Adam? I know it's something that is of concern to, to, to probably to many in the audience, but it seems as though it's of less concern to you. And that's this concept of US secondary sanctions. Yeah. Could you, could you just sort of briefly explain to people what, what they are and why you think it's something that perhaps won't, won't, be, won't be necessary to focus on quite so much in this context? Right, so secondary sanctions here are the sanctions principally with respect to CATSA, a piece of legislation. And what that allows the US to do is sanction, impose financial costs um, on parties that are engaging in transactions with Russian entities the US doesn't like. And so, as I mentioned, the first and perhaps most sort of important component of that is there was sanctions on Turkey following the sale of the S-400s to Turkey. And so the reality is that that does impact Russia. I think it does. And I th I'm not suggesting that they wouldn't be using some of the CATSA authorities, but the impact it would, is indirect almost by definition, right? Because at the end of the day, it's a, it's a sanction that impacts Turkey as well as Russia, but it also impacts Turkey. Uh, and so some of the idea, for instance, is to go after CATSA sanctions with respect to India, which has also purchased the same mil uh, mil missile system. The problem with that, of course, is that could then reduce your ability to be truly multilateral, right? If you really are trying to sort of get others on board, whether Turkey or India or otherwise, and yet you're potentially going to impose sanctions on them, the ability to sort of establish that sort of multilateral front of sort of discord with respect to Russia, I think, does die down quite a bit. So I'm not suggesting it couldn't have any impact at all. I think it would. But the risk to the multilateral and um, approach to Russia, I think, would be too great. And the, and then the impact to Russia is almost by definition indirect in a way that I think that in this context, they want to be much more direct. Uh, and so I think secondary sanctions would likely be a, a secondary option here rather than a primary one. OK, OK, that's very clear. On, on Tuesday, President Biden touched on, in a press conference, touched on the possibility of sanctioning President Putin personally himself. Now, we have seen this in the past, where the EU and the US have sanctioned particular leaders like uh, Mugabe or Lukashenko or Assad or, 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 or Gaddafi. But this would be a significant scaling up of sanctioning the leader of a UN Security Council member. Indeed. Do, do, you, think, do you think that's likely and... Um, if not, why not? I don't think it's likely. I mean, it's, it's, again, it's certainly possible. And as you've said, those are the examples, right? There are, there are several others, Milosevic, Charles Taylor, Nicola Maduro. I mean, a whole host of, of heads of state have been designated by the United States. Query what benefit that would be, right? Because if what you're trying to do is actually limit their access to funds or even just, just notify your displeasure with them, the access to funds is not an issue that a head of state like Putin really cares about. He doesn't, he's gonna, not going to go to an ATM machine anytime soon. Um, and on top of that, you already are expressing your displeasure with him uh, with respect to the sanctions that are focused on Russia. So I'm not sure uh, if it would do much. In fact, as, a, as an actual practical impact, I'm sure it would, wouldn't do much at all. I'm not sure it would help with respect to negotiations or otherwise. Um, so I think it's unlikely. Um, certainly possible, but I think it's unlikely. People usually are, are sanctioned when the US is essentially done with discussions, right? Lukashenko, Gaddafi, Charles Taylor, Slobodan Milosevic, you know, these are people who are not particularly, you know, in, in the good books from the United States, even from a negotiations perspective. I think that we can't afford to do that with, with Russia. So I think it's highly unlikely that we go after either Mr. Putin himself or even some of his senior hierarchy, Sergei Lavrov and others. I think that would be unhelpful uh, to the end and goal here of negotiating the solution. So just rolling back eight years to so 2014, the annexation of Crimea, you were then shuttling around um, helping to coordinate the US and international response. What's your sense about the degree of coordination that is happening now on sanctions between the United States, the European Union and the United Kingdom? And what I mean by that is, would you expect that if there is a triggering event, whatever that is, that they will all impose sanctions around the same time, and will the sanctions largely replicate each other 
I certainly hope so. Uh, and I say that, uh, you know, very much sort of honestly, that I do know there's a lot of coordination going on, I, both uh, embassies and missions in on the continent, and embassies and missions here in Washington uh, as well. But I also know full well that there is disagreements, right? And, and I think we saw some of that with respect to uh, President Biden's statement at his press conference, which may well have been somewhat of a mistake, but at, at the end of the day, I think it's, it demonstrated the evidence. The truth of the matter is there is disagreement amongst NATO and the EU as to how far to go in various circumstances. But I think the concern that many in Europe have is the 2014 re redux. As you know, in 2014, after a lot of coordinating efforts, people like me and others, um, there was limited coordination until the shoot down on the Malaysian airliner. Right after the shoot down of the Malaysian airliner, there was massive coordination and a real step up in European uh, sanctions authorities and sanctions sort of actions. God forbid we need something like that to sort of encourage that action. But that is the fear that I know many people in the, in the administration, some of whom are now back in government after being out during the Trump years, uh, that their concern is that it will cause some other real major action like that of devastation, really, before there's that, that coordinated attack, uh, the coordinated attack on a sanctions perspective. So that is the, that is the worry. Um, I think right now there is a thought that there's going to be a lot of coordination, and I think there will be, uh, but I think that is the nervousness that, that, that some of that when push comes to shove and the rubber hits the road and all the other sort of uh, metaphors, I think the challenge will be actually moving forward. One thing that um, people have not commented on very much at all in, in the run-up to all of this is <clears throat> what steps Russia can take in, in retaliation. Um, and I, and I, I want to bring Meyer in on this question in a moment, but before before I do that, Adam, just from, from, from your experience, again, is this something that would be in the contemplation of the, the US administration and what kind of things do you think Russia could do? Yeah, I, I, it is. I mean, this was also what makes Russia so unique, right? If you think about other jurisdictions the US has sanctioned that have retaliated against the United States or others, the retaliation has not been particularly meaningful and certainly has not fed into the discussion or the analysis therein. Russia has a lot of cards to play here, certainly in comparison to Iran and North Korea and Cuba and all the rest. Um, I'm not suggesting sanctions on the on on Russia would be harmless for them, it certainly wouldn't be, but they could ex express harm to the US and Western interests as well. There are a couple of things I think about. Uh, one, of course, is their continued activities, right? Be it kinetic activities in places like Ukraine, uh, the eastern flank of, of NATO, um, the Baltics, et cetera. Uh, they, of course, have the ability to, to throttle gas, right? At the end of the day, they, the Europeans need Russian gas and the, Europe, the US is trying to sort of shore up those supplies. Uh, but who knows whether they're going to be able to do so. Certainly in the, in the heart of winter, that might be challenging with gas prices and oil prices so high. Um, I think there's the ability for them to do other non-kinetic activities, be it cyber warfare or otherwise. Um, and I think the other piece here, which is interesting, people don't think about is the regional piece looking south. Right, Kazakhstan has just been gone through a real crisis, as I'm sure you all know. Kazakhstan, I visited Kazakhstan after the sanctions on Russia were imposed. There was a lot of disquiet in Kazakhstan because those sanctions were actually impacting them because they got a lot of their goods from Europe via Russia that were now sort of not being allowed. So I think it's a possibility that they could also go into that part of their sphere and sort of make life difficult. And then of course, borders Afghanistan and other sorts of issues for the United States. So the idea that if the US decides to be targeted and focused on the banking sector, for instance, that Russia would only respond in kind, I think is somewhat facile, right? I think Russia could figure out what its response penalty actually looks like and decide to attack on different, er different areas, even if the sanctions have not touched it. So the kinetic and non-kinetic regional destabilization, energy destabilization, all of those things, I think are very much um, in, its, in its toolkit. One final piece is I think Chloe mentioned, is a legal piece in Russia, there has been a law in the Duma that's been sort of proposed to actually illegalize compliance with US and Western sanctions in Russia. That has been held up uh, thus far because the business community in Russia has been very clear that that would cause mass divestment and that so it really wouldn't be good for, good for Russia. That could change and it could become very, very difficult, very much a conflict of laws issue immediately for those companies that cannot extricate themselves from Russia. And I think that is an option that Russia may be considering as well as a retaliatory measure. I, I agree with you. I think it's very, very interesting. There was a, a piece on the front page of the Financial Times today, and there was a reference by a particular bank executive about the worry that complying with Western sanctions could become a criminal offense in Russia and people could find themselves being prosecuted, convicted and going to jail. Uh, and um, taking that to its next level, potentially the criminalization in Russia could have an extraterritorial element in the same way that laws in the United States often have an extraterritorial element. So you could find you know, executives in, 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 in businesses or banking institutions in the UK or in the US or in Europe 
being the subject of criminal prosecutions in, in, in Russia, arrest warrants being issued. Um, I mean, it made me think, it made me consider whether or not thought is being given, because if it isn't, it should be, to whether or not the states or individual companies or banks should be making representations to, to Interpol to say, whatever you do, you are constitutionally forbidden from getting engaged in, in political acts, so do not honor any requests from Russia for uh, Interpol red notices or diffusions yeah. in relation to people who are facing such prosecutions. Anyway, that's a big, that's a big subject. Um, which we know a lot about. Um, Maya, just on the subject, we'll come on to talking about EU and UK sanctions in a, in a moment, but just on that subject, while we're on it, on retaliation. Um, we've seen retaliation from Russia, but we've also seen retaliation from, from, from China, haven't we? Indeed. I mean, sanctions are, as you know, very not only very much in vogue internationally as the sort of go-to foreign policy tool of choice for a number of reasons, but they've also become very internationally complex and somewhat fragmented. So you now have a system of different jurisdictions imposing different kinds of sanctions, which means that it's a very complicated world for the world of compliance. But what it has also meant is different jurisdictions imposing sanctions and then counter sanctions. And that's been particularly obvious recent, recently, in fact, in relation to US sanctions where the EU and the UK, for example, have even tried to enact measures, these are the so-called blocking regulations, to try to make unlawful in their own jurisdiction compliance with, say, what they see as extraterritorial US sanctions. Now, if the US and EU can play that game, then of course so can everyone else. And we've seen that very powerfully in the case of China, uh, who, you know, in response to US, these very serious export control restrictions that Adam is suggesting might be uh, on the table in relation to Russia. China has really imposed very far reaching measures, including sanctioning the legal community who uh, you know, are said to lend some support to those sanctions. So this could get very serious indeed if uh, China thought, if Russia thought that that was in its interest to do so. Uh, it's also fair to say that the sort of EU's version of this, the blocking regulation, although it's sort of legally interesting has not really seen enormous amounts of enforcement. But as you say, if you're starting to talk about imprisoning banking executives in Russia, it could be a very different uh, different picture. Okay, well, wh while we've got you, um, Maya, can I ask you the same question from an EU and UK perspective that I asked Adam at the beginning, which is, can you just sketch for our, for our, for our audience what the current EU and UK measures are against Russia before we come on and talk about what might be coming uh, down the track? Yes, sure. So the current EU and UK measures date from the time that Adam was talking about when the US and the EU were very much hand in hand on Russia sanctions, March 2014, uh, and indeed hand in hand on Iran sanctions. That was the same time that the JCPOA was negotiated. At that time, of course, the UK was part of the EU. So there were only EU sanctions. For those that don't know, Brexit has meant that this year, 20. 21 for the first time the UK has had its own sanctions regime. Um, so when the EU and US were very coordinated on Russia sanctions at that time, uh, they imposed the exactly the kinds of sanctions that Adam was outlining at the beginning, which remain on the books. So that's targeted sanctions still against those said to have undermined the territorial integrity of Ukraine, the import ban on goods from Crimea, the sectoral restrictions on Russian banks, defense and energy companies having access to EU capital markets, restrictions on oil exploration products and so on. Now, what happened broadly is that those remain in the EU, but didn't go much further, no doubt, because of differences between member states about expanding them. But the US sanctions went much further because they went from activities in Ukraine to what the US refers to as Russia's malign activities more generally, election interference, cyber, you name it. So in the US, you start to see those cats as secondary sanctions and, and uh, increased sanctions of a different kind. So the EU sanctions look a bit like they did in 2014. Now, when the UK left the European Union, its UK sanctions um, look the same again. So there are a number of sort of detailed differences with what the UK did, but very broadly speaking, 
um, the position in the UK is, is as it was in the EU. Okay, <clears throat> that's brilliant. And then, as with Adam, can you just let us know what you think um, is now going to be expected from the EU, first of all, and then the, the level of coordination that there might be between the EU and the UK? Sure. So, um, starting with the EU, the short point is it's very hard to say with any certainty, as Adam has said. We know that the European Commission and the Council, which are the sort of relevant uh, bits of the EU machinery, have been working with the External Action Service on what's been described as a wider range of sectoral and individual sanctions in the case of further military aggression by Russia. And they have also publicly said that they're coordinating with their partners, the US, the UK and Canada. But that package of sanctions, so they're obviously doing the legal work on a package of sanctions, that will then have to be put to the Council of Ministers who will have to vote and they can only be put in place with the unanimous agreement of all 27 member states. So a few remarks about that. First of all, it seems to me they are very likely to want to try to announce something in coordination with the US if they possibly can. If you look at re recent sanctions actions on Belarus, on China, and on China in relation to the Uyghurs, there is a general view that sanctions are better together. And so it seems to me if they possibly can, they will try to be as joined up as possible. The public statements by US officials suggest that there is alignment on at least some sanctions. So what's been said publicly there is that they are agreed on the size of the financial institutions and state-owned enterprises that will be targeted, the severity of the measures, the immediacy, um, and the extent to which the prohibitions would affect existing stocks of risk in addition to new flows of financing. Now, who knows if that's right? And certainly who knows what will actually be agreed when it comes to it. What we do know is that the UK Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, is now going around all EU member states trying to get them to agree on a sanctions package. We know there is disagreement on what the triggering event should be. So we have, there not only has to be agreement, of course, on what the sanctions will look like, but what is it that Russia needs to do to have those put in place? Now, Boris Johnson said this week that um, the, those sanctions in the UK would come into effect in the event of a single toe cap of a Russian incursion into more of Ukraine. That's certainly not something that seems to be agreed at EU level. And if you just think for a second about the different policy interests of different EU member states, First of all, of course, the very significant dependence on Russian gas, in particular of Germany, Finland and Sweden. Germany internally divided on what to do and how uh, opposed or otherwise to be. Hungary, Cyprus, states like that. It's very hard to see what they're, you know, to, to what extent they will reach agreement on some sort of package when it comes to it. Now, in the UK, it's quite interesting because there was a lot of speculation about what UK and indeed EU sanctions would look like post Brexit, in, in particular, given that the UK was the most active member state uh, when it came to sanctions policy. And I think it's interesting that there's Ben Wallace still trying to play that role of fostering EU um, communication and agreement on sanctions even post Brexit. Um, so it does suggest some degree of influence of the United Kingdom on EU sanctions still. And of course, whether or not the EU reaches agreement, the UK can now do its own thing and in my view is likely to do so. As I've said, Boris Johnson said, I think on Tuesday that we won't hesitate um, to put more sanctions in place. The UK has mentioned in particular Magnitsky sanctions. These are the um, sanctions that are very in vogue at the moment on those said to have been responsible for gross violations of human rights. UK also has corruption sanctions, so will it use those more individualized uh, sanctions to, to act even if the EU doesn't? And of course the UK has a different dynamic from the EU, so only something like 3% of the UK's gas supplies are from Russia. On the other hand, it's not a straightforward calculation here either, because rising, rising energy prices is probably the last thing the government needs at the moment. And there's a very significant degree of Russian investment in the United Kingdom, coupled with criticism of the government for not being tough enough on Russian money, sometimes elided with sort of money laundering and dirty money in the UK. 
So I think it's a complex picture, but the sort of bottom line is, I would expect the UK to act and I would expect the EU to act, but possibly more slowly and who knows um, on exactly what package. And just focusing on the EU for one, one, one final moment, <clears throat> when you talk about the speed at which the EU is prepared to move, but obviously some EU countries have a greater connection with Russian interests than others. I'm thinking, for example, of, of say Cyprus. And it does seem as though Cyprus has sort of slightly sort of dragged its feet a little bit in, in, in previous um, situations where the EU has been contemplating imposing sanctions. Do, do you see something similar this time? I mean, who knows? Um, you know, sanctions really are a matter of politics. Whether there's going to be a case of one member state holding out, um, um, and I certainly wouldn't be sort of naming Cyprus in that regard, but I think Cyprus just illustrates that there are some jurisdictions where this is a very complicated issue. And since this is politics, you know, who knows, does one hold out on this issue? Does that disadvantage you on other issues? And I think it brings into the spotlight something that's been controversial for some time, which is the requirement for unanimity. On one hand, this is sovereign foreign policy. It's a very important thing. States don't want to give up. One assumes such an important aspect of policy to be decided by majority vote. On the other hand, it means decision making is more cumbersome. And just on the on the subject of um, unity, as you've described, I'd just like to go back to Adam and ask Adam, just, just drawing on your experience, Adam, back in 2014, <clears throat> as you were shuttling between Brussels and, and, and London. First of all, was your sense that the United Kingdom was a major player on sanctions policy within the European Union at that time? If the answer to that is yes, do you think that has been replaced? And if it hasn't been, do you think that's, that's a problem in terms of obtaining this sort of level of collegiality that's required? I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the big concerns about Brexit from a U.S. sanctions perspective was just that, was that the U.S. and the U.K. often saw uh, similar, the world similarly, not surprisingly, perhaps, and the U.K. often would carry the Americans' water, so to speak, to, to the EU. Um, it's certainly, they weren't identical interests, of course, uh, but that was the real concern. And the U UK was very sophisticated, still is very sophisticated on the sanctions front and would bring that sophistication and those viewpoints to, to the commission and to the council. Um, so that is that is a concern. And I don't know if it, that's been replaced. I mean, I hear what, what Maya is saying and Chloe that, that you're dealing with, you know, there are UK ministers that are trying to sort of follow up uh, around, around the EU in this context, but it's a very different world uh, post-Brexit, obviously, and so their ability to actually sit at the table is much, is, doesn't exist anymore, not even, not even reduced. So no, I think that is, that is one of the problems. And, you know, if you don't have the UK as the coordinating authority, quote unquote, or at least a convening authority in the EU, it's not clear to me that the other big states, the French, the Germans, et cetera, are willing, are willing to or able to step up in the same fashion because they are so much more um, divided internally, uh, let alone with respect to the UK, with respect to the US. And so that is a real, it's a real worry. And insofar as, um, <clears throat> just turning to banking then, um, and Chloe, what I'd like to just understand, Adam and Maya have mapped out what might be coming. From a banking perspective, what are the main concerns that you're currently thinking about? That's a great question, Michael. Thank you. I mean, Adam and Maya have done a splendid job in outlining the current sanctions and what future sanctions might look like. And I think in terms of what's being done, what I can say is that compared to 2014, banks are preparing hard and fast. And I've got two key points to make here. First, the difference that I see between now and 2014 is that legislators and regulators are engaging financial institutions in the strategic foreign policy discussions in a really unprecedented way. I think it comes down to trust. There's more trust in the relationship. And what we're seeing is foreign ministries and treasury departments actively seeking the views of banks to try to understand what the operational impact, and the economic impact of certain restrictive measures will have. And this, of course, means that banks are in a better position to prepare for the range of sanctions that could be imposed in the event that there's an invasion by Russia. That said, it's worth remembering that even with this levelling of engagement and with the countless reports and warning signs that we're reading about in the press, there still has to be an element of surprise. Sanctions need to be 
delivered with shock. Um, so even those that are closest to the policy makers don't quite know what that element of surprise is going to be. And the other point that I want to make is about the sort of sanctions that banks are preparing for and whether or not they're really well prepared. I get the feeling that we are in a stronger position because banks have been developing and fine tuning their compliance programs over the past decade. And they can adjust to novel restrictions like sectoral sanctions, which go beyond your standard asset freeze in a way that perhaps we weren't prepared for in 2014. But again, I go back to the element of surprise and shock. There's going to be something that we're not aware of. And um, banks can easily deal with the standard as asset freezes that target individuals and entities. But we've heard a lot about um, new sovereign debt and equity measures, which will have tighter wind down periods, which will be really tricky to navigate through. And also new restrictions on secondary market trading of sovereign debt. And then there's also SWIFT, which we've, we've touched upon. Banks at the moment, I think they're reviewing their relationships, they're trying to resource um, through staffing, training and issuing things like guidance on US persons who may face really tricky conflicts of law and will need to recuse themselves from certain issues. I think for any bank that's got a US, EU and Russia presence will be undertaking a number of different actions. But unless and until sanctions are imposed, it's a little bit of a guessing game. And for now, I think banks are preparing for the worst case scenario, or at least trying to understand what that would look like. Uh, the key questions around this will be the scope of the sanctions, what gets targeted, what sort of measures, what will the flexibility on implementation be in terms of times of wind down, and will these measures crucially be aligned between the US, the EU, and the UK? And that will really have an impact on market disruption. Banks that have got exposure to Russian oligarchs, they'll be looking at their current list of designated oligarchs, if they've got any. They'll look at the Kremlin list that was issued in 2018. And they need to be also looking at the current makeup of the Russian government and PEPs and trying to look at what could future targets of sanctions be like. And they'll need to review all of that information um, also in the context of uh, ultimate beneficial owners, UBOs, you've got high value accounts, trusts, special purpose vehicles, and across the board at the relationships in high risk sectors like oil, gas, rail, and steel. Um, the other thing I think it's important to be looking at, and the banks will definitely be looking at this, is um, to try to avoid asset flight. Asset flight is a real problem when you don't quite know what's going to happen, but you do know that it's going to impact potentially jurisdictions like um, assets being moved to Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Greece. I can carry on with the, with the list. So I think looking at large transactions from Western financial institutions to moving to any of these jurisdictions will be uh, a key element of a bank's review to try and understand what the flow of funds will look like. And it may well be evidence that Russia is trying to, we can't say evade sanctions because they haven't been imposed yet, but um, certainly that will be interesting information that banks will be looking at. I think the other key area is contractual agreements. Um, banks will be looking at all the different types of contractual agreements that they have across the board of financial instruments where there's a Russian nexus. I think one really interesting point worth making here is that a lot of these agreements will be in relation to long-term products that could have been entered into decades ago where sanctions clauses weren't really a feature. And this in and of itself could present quite a problematic issue for banks in terms of adverse credit, operational issues and reputational harm. Well, that's an extraordinary menu of things that have to be considered. I, I just want to um, pick up on something that's been raised um, in, the, in the questions that are, that, are, that are coming through from the audience. What, there's a, there are a number of different themes. One relates to the sectoral sanctions that have been um, touched upon. Um, obviously, there's a huge amount of sensitivity around the reliance of European, particularly European countries like Germany, on Russian energy. And you, you mentioned in passing, Adam, that there may be some, some carve out um, for the energy sector, so to speak. Obviously, we saw the oil and gas sector and exploration in particular being the subject of sectoral sanctions back in 2014. So, so do you think, do, in terms of the carve-out, any sense of what that carve-out is going to look like? And also, 
if the banks that these oil and gas companies are banking with are themselves and sub blacklist is the carve out going to make any difference yeah no I, I, it's a great question and i think in, in in this one area i think chloe and i might disagree with respect to the strategy i actually don't think the concern is about either asset flight nor surprise right usually for sanctions both those things are absolutely critical because what you're trying to do is limit asset flight and increase surprise right in order to sort of really change their attitude I think that when you're dealing with great states, large states um, with sophisticated players that sort of have been subject to sanctions for so long and sort of know how the game is played, I think both those issues are, are less important. And it's much more important perhaps to engage in clarity prior to sanctions so you can tell people what is gonna happen so you can potentially change the calculus going forward. In my mind, that's the only chance we have for sanctions to work. I mean, at the end of the day, Putin is still in Crimea and will likely be in Crimea for the foreseeable future. Um, and so I think that the question is, how do we get him to not move into places like Ukraine? What is the what do we need to do? And I think that there you need to be very, very clear. And so one of the ideas people are talking about is what do we carve out? Right. In other words, we wouldn't say talk about carve outs if we weren't going to be as clear as possible. And so, yes, I think one of the questions is, do you carve out very sensitive areas, not because we want to carve them out, but frankly, to be perfectly frank, in order to maintain multilateralism. Right. Because at the end of the day, if the Germans are not going to sign on to something because it impacts their flow of gas during the winter, especially, that's not a that, that's a no, that's a non-starter. So I, I do see the potential of an actual carve out explicit carve out, potentially a licensing carve out. In other words, it's not carved out in the state of the, of the regulations, but there are exemptions that are provided through general exemptions or otherwise that maybe have a wind down procedure associated with them. I think that's certainly a possible uh, conclusion, but you're right. It, it, the other piece of this, which is interesting is that there's nothing, is everything is fungible really, right at the end of the day. And I think that the, the reality is that if we carve out energy uh, and then that's what we end up doing, right? Anyway, we end up sort of carving out and exempting one of the largest parts of the Russian economy, the part that really gets most of the hard currency into the system. Does that then do enough damage or, or concern Putin enough to actually change his calculus? Uh, that's really the, 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 the question. And then of course the idea is that if we carve out energy, Russia will not retaliate by focusing on energy. I think, as I said earlier, is not an accurate statement. I think at the end of the day, if decide if Russia decides that the impact on de-swifting or going after its banks or the export control issues is so great that they need to have the Europeans face the consequences, they I think they will certainly turn off the spigots, um, even if energy has been written as written out, so to speak, of the sanctions. So we certainly have examples of the way things have been carved out in the past. I mean, as you know, in the Iran context, there were pipelines, Shadanese, for example, was, was explicitly uh, carved out in the in the regulations. Something similar could be carved out here without much question. The question is, why would you do that if what you're trying to do is really hit Putin where it hurts? And where it hurts for Putin is really only one or two, maybe three sectors where that would work and energy is one of them. Uh, and just finally on the carve out aspect of it, it does seem sort of slightly inconsistent to be saying, we'll give a carve out to the Russian energy sector. But as the Times was reporting, the Times in London was reporting this morning, the United States has said, you know, if Russia invades Ukraine, Nord Stream 2 is not exactly. gonna go ahead. Exactly, exactly. So it's not, again, people are just not entirely all on the same page here, right? Because at the end of the day, Nord Stream 2 is done, right? A couple of bolts need to be tightened, and that's about it. And But they need regulatory approval. Uh, and if there's no regulatory approval, it doesn't start up. And if they're saying that they're not going to give regulatory approval, then the big energy flows they're talking about won't start coming through Nord Stream 2. So there's a whole host of sort of strangeness associated with this. I think people are sort of at this stage still sort of throwing their hands up in the air, not quite sure how to get everyone on board, let alone if you get everyone on board, what's the extent of the sanctions you can impose and keep that unanimity, the unanimity that Maya was talking about from the EU 27 plus London plus plus Washington. And I, I just want to draw a couple of questions together into, into one question. And it relates kind of to export controls. And I think there's a particular focus on the on the electronics market. Um, so perhaps, Adam, if you could say a little bit more about, how, about what you think export control limitations might look like. And then also just stepping back a little bit um, in the context of export controls of those types of products, might that have a knock on effect of actually driving Russia closer to China? So so increasing the, co the commercial and business links with, with China, which in the long term could ultimately be counterproductive. 
That's exactly right. And this export control idea comes straight from the China playbook, right? Explicitly, this is where it comes from. The foreign direct product rule was imposed against Huawei. Um, and, and again, the idea is that Russia does not produce all of the things it needs to produce its goods for, internally. It needs to import them largely from the United States, or at least in large measure from the United States, certainly high technology issues like chips. Uh, and so what the foreign direct product rule would say is that you will not get chips from the United States and you cannot get chips in places like Taiwan either, because those factories in Taiwan rely upon US technology to produce the chips that they would then sell on to Russia. And so that's how it would work. Um, my understanding is that the Russian modernization tool uh, techniques with respect to the military has been highly digitizing their military, therefore relying upon this very te this technology. Um, and I think it could impact them. Whether in the immediate term or not, it's not clear. Certainly in the medium to long term, it would. Um, and that there's consumer issues about, you know, PlayStations and that kind of thing as well. It, it's not unimportant from the perspective of getting your people behind you, but obviously that's not the key impact I think people would be, would be, would be uh, hearing. Um, and so that's the other issue, right? Is that what does the, that's one of the retaliation points that I think is important to recognize. It's not necessarily a direct retaliation with respect to Europe and the US. There's a, there's a response. The response I think would very much be Putin get going closer into the arms of President Xi. In fact, one of the things people are saying is that the likelihood of an invasion in the Ukraine prior to the end of the Beijing Olympics is very low because you don't want President Xi to get mad at President Putin for sort of moving the attention of the world away uh -huh. from the grand uh -huh. diplomatic exercise in Beijing. So I think that that's definitely a possibility. And, and, and the China component of this, I, I wrote about in my foreign affairs piece as, as that the Russia model is very much a dress rehearsal for potentially going after China. And I think the challenge is with respect to Russia, it's just going to be nth degree more uh, with respect to going yes. after China, but a similar set of issues is going after major states with major uh, ties to the West and the rest of the world, and what that means from use, use of sanctions perspective in both contexts. Um, I think quite a few of the questions that have been raised will be answered by those people if they, they read your foreign affairs, your excellent foreign affairs piece, Adam. Um, I've, I've got a question that has been raised, which I'd like to put to, to, to Maya. Now, in 2014, with the, with the EU sanctions, Obviously, for the EU to sanction an individual, a lot of the, the reasons that were given, the underlying reasons were the same, i.e. the act of the individual concerned undermined the territorial integrity of Ukraine, whether it was through Donbass or whether it was through the annexation of Crimea. So it might be somebody who spoke out in favor of the annexation in the Duma or, or, or provided support or people on the ground in Crimea or whatever it might be. Do, do you think that if sanctions are are now going to be uh, ramped up against, say, oligarchs or those who are considered to be um, um, influential in some way, D doesn't, doesn't the listing reason have to tie in in some way with their behavior? So doesn't that make it quite difficult from a UK or an EU perspective to be able to justify sanctioning an individual if, for example, it, you cannot draw a link between their activity and um, and the Russian invasion. Um, I think it doesn't make it very difficult um, because it's actually pretty easy to put people <coughs> on the sanctions list. I'm sure everyone from the government listening will throw up their hands in horror at that suggestion. But the fact is, they <laughs> it's very easy to design very broad criteria. So in a case like this, so as I've said, so far Russia sanctions have been have stuck in the EU and UK to Russia's actions in 2014 in Ukraine. But there are plenty of sanctions regimes that say support for the government is enough to get you on a sanctions list. So yes, it's true that the criteria for listing people will have to change, but I'm not sure it's so hard. And, and actually this raises um, a really interesting point, I think, which is just standing back. It's easy to impose sanctions, relatively speaking, compared with other solutions, troops on the ground. Um, but I think what this whole debate throws up, among other interesting questions, is what exactly are these sanctions trying to do and how are they trying to achieve them? And very often you find with sanctions regimes, probably intentionally, but I don't know, is that they don't really specify what they're trying to do. And they certainly don't specify how to get those sanctions lifted. And maybe that sort of vagueness is, is an effective policy tool, I don't know. But it certainly makes it difficult to measure the effectiveness of sanctions. But if you take this case in particular, these are sanctions that we've heard are unlikely to be imposed before Russia takes an aggressive step, whatever that will be. 
So what is the purpose at that stage of imposing sanctions? Is it suggested that these sanctions are actually designed to get the troops to turn around and go home? Um, that, uh, you know, because they're plainly not trying to, I mean, perhaps the very threat of them is supposed to be great enough to stop President Putin from going in. But what is the change of behavior exactly that is required? Before sanctions were tied to some extent to fulfilling the Minsk agreements, and we'll see what is said in terms of a kind of pathway going forward. But just finally, it seems to me, this is a very big ask in sanctions terms, and it's very fascinating. As Adam said, there may be a bigger ask even with China, but it seems to be more even than the Iran nuclear situation to try to impose sanctions on a major power as a way of preventing or reversing war is probably a bigger use of sanctions in policy terms than we've had before. And it's worth remembering that sanctions used to be used in conjunction with war. Now for the first time, really in the last century, um, sanctions are, are used in theory as a sort of way of preventing war. But these discussions we're having today show how difficult that is and how particularly difficult in the case of Russia, where, I mean, President Putin famously said in 2015, our sovereignty is not up for sale. And in a jurisdiction which is such a major power, which is to some extent engaged in not encouraging dissent uh, and perhaps you know, blaming the West for the activities going on anyway, will it be the case that President Putin will in fact tolerate a greater degree of economic hardship for Russia than other jurisdictions might, may even wear sanctions as a badge of honor and a sort of PR um, campaign, particularly in circumstances where as compared with 2014, Russia has been busy preparing, de-dollarizing, relying much less on foreign lending, much more, as Adam has said, on trade with China, building up a swift equivalent compared with the EU's absolute sort of gas dependency. So it will be absolutely fascinating from a policy and legal perspective to see what happens. So <clears throat> just picking up on that, Adam, I'd just like to ask you, I mean, that, Maya raises a number of incredibly interesting points. I mean, taking it ultimately to its end, we, we haven't had a situation before where sanctions have been imposed as a consequence of a sort of full-scale invasion, so to speak. If international sanctions imposed by Western authorities then don't really have the effect that they're designed to do, because as Maya says, Russia has been preparing workarounds since 2014, is it possible that this could be kind of the beginning of the end of sanctions on major powers? I mean, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a humble lawyer, right? I just see this as a sort of, do these things really have the effect? But it seems to me it's a real test for sanctions as a policy. But, it, you know, in answering that question, you have to think what alternatives are there? Right. Um, no, that's exactly right. It, and, it, and, you know, it's, it's not as though this is the end of great, of great power sanctions. In some respects, it's the beginning, right? As I said, the Russian economy is twice the combined size of every other economy the U.S. has ever sanctioned, right? So that's other than Russia, there's never been a situation where we've sanctioned great powers. It's just not something that we've done or the EU has done or the UK has done. Historically, sanctions maybe 100 plus years ago, that's what was done between the French and the Brits and the Americans and all the rest, but certainly not in modern sanctions time. So listen, sanctions are principally used historically against non-great powers. They're against peripheral powers, non-state ent entities, narcotics traffickers, et cetera. That's where sanctions have been, have been used and that's where these tools have been honed. The, Iran was a state was a situation in which you had an actual major ish state that was being sanctioned. But other than that, there's never really been a situation like that. So this is, as Maya said, this is a real test for this tool. And I think for the tool of multilateralism more generally, because I think at the end of the day, if this is going to work, that's the only way it will work. And one final thing about but it, I mean, it, it has been used again. In 2014, it was used. And there are people that, that say that, yes, Russia is in Crimea and Russia is in the Donbass. But if not for sanctions, Russia would already be in Kyiv, right? Already be uh, in, in, in the Western part of the country. So I don't know. You always have to ask these weird counter historicals to figure out whether or not that's true or not. But that's certainly an argument that has been made that, that it, they, had, they worked in a, in a way that's obviously hard to demonstrate. And maybe they can work again in this context. Well, on that profound geopolitical point, I'm going to have to bring this webinar to a close. Can I thank you, um, Maya, Adam and Chloe, very much indeed for, for such instruction. Um, I hope those who've been listening have found it um, very instructive and very educational. It, it, please um, keep an eye on, the, on our sanctions blog, because if there are any major developments in this space in the coming weeks and months, 
we will we, we will repeat this webinar if sanctions are imposed. We can we can all come on and talk about what that actually is going to mean uh, once we understand a little bit more about what's happening in practice. So um, thank you all very much again uh, for attending. I also interrupt and say that we will we will try there have been really fascinating questions asked um so particularly in so far as they're within our competence which not all of them i suspect are speaking for myself we will try to get back to 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 people and i will delegate most of them to adam and chloe um but we really will try and get around to them i'm sorry there hasn't been time but we've had such a flood of interest and it's just great to see that engagement Yes, um, here, here, I, I, I agree with that. We'll do our very best to respond to, to all of you and deal with all your queries. So until we see you again, thank you very much. Goodbye.